want to do a study today on the Jews and the land of Israel. And the study is going to be about God's blessing that comes on the Jews, but how it's connected to their being in their land, their land of promise. Let's look at the scriptures, what the Bible has to say about this. The book of Hebrews chapter 11. Go to the book of Hebrews in your King James Bible. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11, beginning in verse 8. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. All right, there's a land that was given to the Jewish people, the land of Israel, and that promise didn't go away. All right, a lot of people try to say, well, the church has replaced Israel. Okay, then you need, there's a land there that should be going to the church then. And I realize the Catholic Church tries to get their hand into the whole thing of, you know, there are different holy sites in Jerusalem, and they made the whole, uh, what was the thing that was it the Balfour Declaration or something? Can't think of it right now. It's not in my notes, but they made this whole thing between the Jews and the Catholics years ago. But uh, that's not what Bible believing Christians believe. All right, Bible believing Christians believe that the land of Israel is for the Jews. Now, someday in the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, he'll be over there, Jesus will be there, and we, his saints, will go and report to him, but we'll be ruling and reigning with him on the earth. And I don't believe it's just going to be from the city of Jerusalem. I think he'll put us in different areas and things. Um, so I'm heirs in terms of uh, by a spirit of adoption, yes, but I'm not a Jew. I'm a Gentile Christian. Not a problem, okay? So I have no right to say that land belongs to me over there or something like that. But if you were a physical descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob coming down through that line, then you have a right to that land, and God's blessings come in that land. And if you get outside of that land, then those blessings aren't there. I'll tell you that. That's going to be what the study will be about. Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy 32. But you see, like anything else, there's a limit to how much money you can make in uh, if you stay in the land. If you do things God's way, God puts a limit. Hmm. But if you do things uh, man's way, or especially the devil's way, well, you can make a lot of money. And sadly, that's what a lot of the Jews have chosen to do. They've rejected Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, so that they can make money. That's why Jesus, when he was here on the earth, he said, you cannot serve God and mammon. You either love the one and hate the other, or, you know, despise the one and and uh you know love the other one basically is what the jesus taught there and um, a lot of those jews they they loved uh, mammon another way of saying money all right like a false god of money is what that was all about but let's read here deuteronomy chapter 32 um piece of paper here verse 7 through 10 Remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will show thee, thy elders, and they will tell thee. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. There are twelve boundaries. Right? It doesn't mean that the number of the children of Israel, and that can always be changing if there's, depending on how many Jews are out there or something. I mean, it would be so confusing. No, God makes it according to the number of the children of Israel. Twelve, okay? Twelve boundaries. Very simple. Not that difficult. Anybody messes with that, they're, they've got some issues. But there's an inheritance there. Notice that. Uh, for the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. Okay, verse 8, when the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance. See, it's not about, hey, I want you people to separate. Back in the book of Genesis, the Tower of Babel thing, he confounded their tongues so that they would spread out. And he says, okay, now you stay out there and you stay out there. Okay, good. Now don't, don't cross those boundaries or I'll, I'll whip you. I'll do some bad things to you. That's not what happened there. The Lord says, I'm going to give you special inheritance. 
I'm going to make things happen in those, those different lands where the bounds are. And it's going to be the perfect thing for you. Imagine a farmer and he says, um, okay, I'm going to take the, I'm going to have a pond, farm pond that I'm going to put in and I'm going to stock it with fish. And that's the perfect place for them. And over here, I'm going to have a nice grassy meadow, perfect place for my cows. I'm over here. I'm going to have a nice place down kind of lower area down in there, some mud wallows and things down there for the the swine, the pigs down in there. And over here, I'm going to have a spot where there's a lot of bugs over there and a, kind of a neat little area protected by some trees and things. That'll be for my chickens. No, no, you can just mess it up. Let's have the fish go on over to the pasture, see how that works, and have the cows go down into the muddy area for the where the swine are at and have the chickens go over to the pond and try to swim. <laughs> things that get all messed up. No, a smart farmer will look and he'll say, I know what's out there. I, I know what's good for my animals. I remember seeing a thing, this organic dairy farmer the one time, and he was talking about, he was naming every single plant in his pastures. It was just amazing. Well, that's, you know, Timothy grass over there, and that's red clover, and this is this. And he, I mean, he just knew things I never even heard of before. That's a good farmer. Well, God is a lot better than a good farmer. And God says, depending on who you are, I have a land of inheritance for you. And you get out of that land, you get out of the bounds of your habitation, problems start to arise. Um, you say, well, what about you, Brian? You're a, a white man living in North America. That's not the bounds of your original habitation. I'm 100% European, okay? I, again, I have the video here on this channel. You can go check that out. Um, Brian Denlinger is not a Jew, is what the thing is. People have accused, oh, I think you look Jewish or something, whatever. I'm not a Jew. And, um, but my sister went and she had a DNA test done. 100% European. And I'm not adopted and she's not adopted. We're part of the same family. So 100% European uh, genetically. Well, then I should be in an area that's similar to Northern Europe. And I am. I'm in Northern Maine. So, and the Bible says that, that Japheth would dwell in the tents of Shem. So this land here belongs to Shem. That's why I went to Peckway Valley High School in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. That's why I like to go and I fished a lot at the Susquehanna River. Hmm. My father collected Indian arrowheads. He'd go out and look for them. Uh, my grandfather taught me a lot of uh, things about wild edibles and things that the Native Americans had taught his ancestors. I hunt, I fish, I forage, just very much like the Native American people. Um, I fought to stop Wolfton mining coming into the area here, Pickett Mountain, right near the Penobscot Nation and the Holton Band of Maliseet. Their lands are right on either side of it. And they're saying that those are sacred hunting grounds that they have. I fought for them. And I'll continue to fight for the native people. This is their land. This is Shemitic land. But I'm here dwelling in the tents of Shem. I live very much like they live. I don't have a huge big European mansion and, and whatever else and have servants and farm things and whatever. No, I like to hunt and fish and forage for food. And I live in a little tiny house on a good amount of land connected to nature, very much like the Shemitic people. Because you see, I follow scripture. That's what I believe in because I want to have blessing. I want to have inheritance there. Now, if I was a Jew, okay, I'm not. Don't have any hatred in my heart for Jews, but let me just explain it. Um, if I was a Jew, I wouldn't want to be in this country. If I read the scriptures and I believe the scriptures, I'd say, I think I need to get back to Israel. With all the killing and fighting and everything, oh yeah, God will protect me there. That's where I'm supposed to be. That's where I'll prosper. And I've known of a few Jews and things. I've had Jews contact this ministry and um, they say, you know, I want to be in Israel. I'm not an American. See, it doesn't say, the Bible doesn't say Shem shall dwell in the tents of Shem. No, it says Japheth, the ancestor of the white races, he would come here and dwell like the Shemitic people, the Native American people, the indigenous people here. And I like those types of people. I've, I've known quite a few in the area here and growing up and everything else. But uh, Jews? Do Jews have a right to this land? Oh, uh, well, you know. Between you and me, I, you know, 
let's get in here and get involved in the Federal Reserve and we can get into the stock market thing and we can go to New York City and hey, we'll make it the new Israel there in New York City, you know what I mean? And uh, we'll just trade and swindle and merchant type of stuff happening. And See, God's blessing comes on you. It's a supernatural blessing that comes and he'll show you things from scripture and you'll live according to the scriptures. That's God's blessing. When you have somebody and they're lying and che cheating and stealing and everything else and they say, well, see, God must be for me because look at how much money I have. That's not the standard. That is not the standard. But that's what a lot of them do, unfortunately. I'll, let me show you one, a Jew, Jewess here, that uh, she left Israel and we'll see what happened. The book of Ruth, turn towards the New Testament there, a few books over to the book of Ruth. And uh, Joshua judges Ruth. <laughs> it kind of comes out funny. Um, the book of Joshua, the book of Judges, the book of Ruth. All right. Ruth chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, down through verse 5. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Wait a second, you're leaving the bounds of your habitation. The inheritance is right there. Can't you pray about the uh, famine? Couldn't God provide for you? Oh, but yeah, Moab's, there's a lot of better stuff over there. <clears throat> Verse 2, And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Malon and Chilion, uh, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left, and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Malon and Chilion died, also both of them, and the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Huh. I wonder why they died. Oh, it's just a normal thing. There was nothing to it, nothing to see here. You know, there isn't any kind of sin or anything there that God punished them for. Uh, leaving the land and then, you know, marrying the women of those countries, which you're not supposed to do in the Old Testament. Very clearly, uh, over and over again, it's condemned in the Old Testament. Um, <clears throat> go down to verse 19 of the same chapter, Ruth chapter 1, verse 19. So they too went until they came to Bethlehem, and it came to pass, when they were come to Bethlehem, that all the city was moved about them, and they said, Is this Naomi? And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, call me uh, Mara, for the Almighty hath, hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? Well, praise the Lord, Naomi. I'm glad that you realized your sin. But you know what? It's a blessed thing when you have somebody that's like this, somebody that can say, the Lord hath afflicted me because of the great, the evil things that I've done, the bad things that I've done. You know what? I have a lot of health issues right now. Oh, why? Why would God do that to me? Uh, because of my sin in my past. That's why. Well, it was, um, um, uh, it was my parents, my parents. It's their fault. You know, I'll do a little sick mind Freud, lay on the couch here and say it was, you know, all my childhood that directed me wrong. No, it wasn't. It was me. It was my decision. Um, I snuck behind my parents' back and ate a lot of junk food. They didn't just say, oh, eat as much as you want, eat as much candy as you want. No, they would have to take my candy away from me a lot of times. Oh, it was so good, but yeah, later on in life, you start to suffer from eating junk food for, you know, 30 years. <sighs> 49 now, and in many ways, I'd feel like I'm, you know, I'm healthy. I take good care of myself, but there's a lot of things I have wrong with me because of my sin. There's a lot of things that are wrong up here in my head because of the sin of looking at pornography over the years. Well, it's because your parents. You know, no, no, it wasn't because of my parents. I hid it from them. And I would get in trouble if, that was, if I was caught with dirty magazines and whatever else. You see, I have to pay for my sins. Do you understand what I'm saying? You have to pay for your sins. And don't blame some preacher or your parents or your school teacher or whatever else. 
There might be people that, that influenced you wrongly. I get that. But the Bible teaches self-judgment. You judge yourself. See, a good ministry, uh, and I have to say this, I don't, I don't try to, you know, oh, look at me, a uh, good ministry. No, I'm just simply stating a fact. You can make up your own mind about this ministry. But a good ministry will convict you of your sins. Because if I can convict you of your sins and I can make you realize that you're a sinner and that you've messed up a lot in your life, then you might actually want to change. And then we might actually have somebody out there, a viewer, that your life improves because you're now taking a harder stand against the sins that messed you up in the past. And that's what I want. I don't want a bunch of sinful people, a bunch of people that have no conviction of their sins, and all that they do is just sit there and just say, oh, brother, he's such a wonderful preacher. He makes me feel so good. Let's just send him all this money and whatever else. Oh, and I just, I'm thinking, oh, man, I, boy, these positive sermons sure get me lots of money. I could be Smiley Joe. Of course, I'd have to shave my beard. I look too, you know, too rough and gruff and whatever else, and I'd have to clean up my, you know, the way I preach and everything and be more positive and more polished and... That's not what I do. I want you to get so convicted about your sin that you quit that sin to the very best of your ability. You know, um, you can't be sinless, but you should sin less. You know, the, kind of one of the old sayings goes, um, sin is negative. Sin is negative. It always hurts you. Get it out of your life as much as possible. It's a struggle. It's warfare every day. Well, God wants us living in victory, not in war. <laughs> okay, all right. Then ignore the New Testament, you know. Ignore Galatians chapter 5 and, you know, don't read that. And there's a bunch of other things in the New Testament. In the Pauline epistles, uh, yeah, you should ignore those too. Um, just kind of pretend that God's okay with your sin and see what he does for you. Um, or get victory over it. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Let's go there. But you can see a good example there of Naomi. And uh, I believe Naomi is a saved woman. I believe she's in heaven right now with the Lord. First part of the resurrection of the saints. And uh, she got up there and she realizes her mistake. I shouldn't have left. I was there in the land of promise. God could have provided. God would have provided. I mean, you know, they came back to Israel. Were there any Jews left in Israel when they came back? Ruth comes back and she says, Wow, I might have sinned going to Moab, but man, all the other Jews died. God couldn't take care of them. It was a sure, sure was a good thing we left. Sure was a good thing we took care of our problems ourselves and didn't wait on the Lord. That's, that's a good thing we did here. That's not what she said. She came back and they're saying, Oh, <laughs> Naomi, that, that is you, isn't it? kind of funny how the way it's written it doesn't say it exactly but you have to wonder how much she aged in those 10 years how much she changed probably came back looking pretty haggard and whatever else not looking so good oh Naomi is that you boy you don't look too good yeah that's what sin does to you life of sin tends to age you tends to uh, make things look pretty bad Deuteronomy chapter 28, beginning in verse 1. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken dil diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. That's a promise. And by the way, it will be fulfilled one day with the Lord Jesus Christ when he's ruling and reigning physically in Jerusalem. Anybody tells you anything different? They're a liar. There's all these posties come out and all these, you know, preterists and everything. Oh, it's already happened in the past. Bunch of satanic liars. Post-millennial people come out and they say that man is going to bring in a kingdom. <laughs> and that Jesus Christ just sits up there and he's so impressed with it. And he watches it for a thousand years and then he comes down at the end and says, Hey, good job. <laughs> what a stupid bunch of nonsense. No. And preterism teaches that it already happened. We're in the thousand-year kingdom right now, only Jesus isn't really physically on the earth. He's just kind of there in the, in the form of his church. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And the book of Revelation. Well, all that happened in the first century. Um, it just kind of was symbolic. 
you know, the third of all the trees burning up, you know, and all the grass burning up, and the ocean turning to blood, and all that it symbolically happened in the first century. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign this earth, on this earth, for 1,000 years, and Israel will be the greatest nation. But only because Jesus Christ did it. Now, if you're a Jew, you might want to kind of move in that direction, you know, kind of get over there to Israel a while. I mean, there's still the rest of the church age and then the catching up of the body of Christ and then the time of Jacob's trouble, then the millennial kingdom gets started. But that's where you want to be. That's where you're going to see all the signs and wonders to confirm the revelation of Jesus Christ, you know, the end of the New Testament there, revelation of Jesus Christ, right there. I have a lot of other stuff in the back of my Bible. Verse 3, Blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the field. That'd be pretty good. If you're in the land, the blessings are coming upon you in the city and in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy ground. The, your children, in other words, the fruit of thy ground, what you're growing, and the fruit of thy cattle, the increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall thy basket and thy... Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way, and flee before thee seven ways. The Lord shall command the blessings upon thee in thy storehouses, and in all that thou settest thine hand unto. And he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. The Lord shall establish thee in holy people unto himself, as he hath sworn unto thee, if thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God, and walk in his ways. And all the people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of thee. And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods, in the fruit of thy body, and in the fruit of thy cattle, and in the fruit of thy ground, in the land which the Lord sware unto thy fathers to give thee. Just hold on a second there. You say, well, this can't be true, because you see, look what people think of Israel. I wonder if it could be because all the Jews are not in Israel. Hmm. I wonder what would happen if all the Jews around the world that are scattered into the different countries because they rejected Jesus Christ, so the Lord scattered them. Um, I wonder what would happen if those Jews all said, you know what? Israel is the land of promise. That's our land. We're going back there. I mean, there's Jews that are there that they believe that. They say, you know, this... Uh, these Palestinians, they don't have a right to this land. That's our property over there, there in Gaza. That's our property over here and that, there. And you don't have a right to be there. We're going back there. And all the Jews would leave and go back there. I mean, what good would it do if people were protesting, you know, Palestinians, you know, free Palestine, uh -huh, you know, over here in America, if there's no Jews present? <laughs> all the Jews are back in Israel. You get a bunch of nuts here in the streets, you know, the universities, free Palestine, uh, you know, river to the sea, Palestine will soon be whatever. Uh, you know, it wouldn't matter. It wouldn't mean anything. But why are they protesting here? Because there are Jews in this country. Jews that should be back in their land. The land of Israel. You're great financiers and you have all this money and everything. Take it back to Israel. Make your land great. Show what God is is able to do through the Jewish people when you are in your land, the land of promise. Verse 10, or excuse me, verse 12. The Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure, the heaven to give the rain unto thy land in his season, and to bless all the work of thine hand. And thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. Is Israel borrowing right now? Yeah, I think that they are. Israel has to lean on America for support. What would happen if all the Jews that are here in America, the financiers and everything else, what would happen if they went over there to Israel? Hmm. Instead of trying to run the country here and from New York City with Wall Street, instead of trying to run things from here, go back to Israel and see what God will do for you. You'd prosper all of a sudden. Hmm. Verse 13, And the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail, and thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath, if that thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day, to observe and to do them. And thou shalt not go aside 
from any of the words which I command thee this day, to the right hand or to the left, to go after other gods to serve them. But it shall come to pass, if thou will not, wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe, to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Now I want you to just stop right here. We'll stop the study. Okay? We're going to continue. Get back to the scriptures in a minute. But I want you to think about this. If the Bible says, these are the blessings that will come on you, if you keep the word of God, if you are keeping his commandments and things, if you are there in the land of promise, not leaving the bounds of your habitation, and you see that, scientifically, logically, you would look and you'd say, okay, when this was written, after Deuteronomy was written, did the Jews obey the Lord in the land? Yeah, there were different times that they did. Did they prosper? Yes. According to the word of the Lord, they did. Okay. Then let's take this to the next level of scientific logical reasoning. Did the Jews eventually depart from the Lord? Did they stop following his commandments? Did they stop following the word of God? Yes. Before Jesus even showed up on the earth, they were already departing from the Lord. And the Lord comes down. God manifest in the flesh comes down, not the Trinity. Okay, get that. Get a hold of that one. There's no Trinity in the New Testament. There's no Trinity in the Old Testament. Actually, no, I'm sorry. Slap, slap. There is a Trinity that's coming. It's called the beast, the false prophet, and the dragon. So there is a Trinity, three different persons, uh, yeah, so there is a trinity in the New Testament. It's not called trinity, but you can kind of reason it because there are three separate persons. Uh, but with God, there's no three separate persons. There's only one person in God made up of three parts, body, soul, spirit. Very simple. Works that way. Jesus is God. He is the body of God. The Father is the soul. The Holy Ghost is the spirit. I've been preaching this for many years. It's called the Godhead doctrine. Godhead appears three times in the Bible. Let's figure it out. Okay, but the Jews, they rejected God manifest in the flesh. And look what curses came upon them. Not my opinions, not my narrow-minded, bigoted, anti-Semitic, no, let's read the curses down through here, and we're going to see if they happen to the nation of Israel, to the Jewish people from the first century on. Let's see if it happened. Verse 16, Cursed shalt thou be in the city. Cursed shalt thou be in the field. Cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy land, the increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep. Cursed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and cursed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall send upon thee cursing, vexation, and rebuke in all that thou settest thine hand unto for to do, until thou be destroyed and until thou perish quickly because of the wickedness of thy doings, whereby thou hast forsaken me. Did it happen? Mm -hmm. The Jews have been kicked out of different nations. The Jews have routinely failed over and over again. They get involved in the finance thing and people get mad about it because the Jews are going too far and they're doing all kinds of other corrupt dealings and things. And the people rise up and they kick them out of the land. They put them to death. Like what happened in Nazi Germany? Study what happened there. Why were the German people so mad at the Jews? Why all of a sudden did they turn against the Jews? Because the Jews were getting involved in socialism and because the Jews were messing around with the stock market and taking business away from the German people, they were messing around with their money. That's what they were doing. Study the history. That's what happened. They fulfilled scripture. And the Old Testament too. I'm not talking about the New Testament. A lot of Jews try to go after the New Testament. Oh, it's so anti-Semitic. How about this? In the book of Deuteronomy. All these curses that God puts upon the Jewish people because they forsake him. Hmm. Verse 21. The Lord shall make the pestilence cleave unto thee until he have consumed thee from off the land, whither thou goest to possess it. The Lord shall smite thee with a consumption, and with a fever, and with inflammation, and with an extreme burning, and with the sword, and with blasting, and with mildew, and they shall pursue thee until thou perish. And thy heaven that is over thy head shall be brass, and the earth that is under thee shall be iron, 
kind of interesting because in the end times of the fifth kingdom that we're currently in, it's part iron, part miry clay. Hmm. Iron and earth. The earth that is under thee is iron. Interesting. The Lord shall make the rain of thy land powder and dust. From heaven shall it come down upon thee until thou be destroyed. And it's not saying that the Israel, the, the Jews are just completely wiped out. That's not what it's saying in context. He's just saying thou, meaning singular people that are reading this and things. Um, <clears throat> verse 25. The Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. Thou shalt go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them and shalt be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. I just, I can't handle I think we should report this to the, you know, ADL or something, you know, and this is defamation. This is anti-Semitism. This is Old Testament. And did it happen? Yes, it happened. I mean, and shall be removed on, into all the kingdoms of the earth. Did the Jews get dispersed throughout all the different kingdoms of the earth? Yes. They were scattered into all the different nations because they rejected Jesus Christ. First they rejected the written word, and then they rejected the manifest word. John chapter 1 talks about that. Verse 26, And thy carcass shall be meat unto all fowls of the air, and unto the beasts of the earth, and no man shall fray them away. The Lord will smite thee with the botch of Egypt, and with the emeralds, and with the scab, and with the itch, whereof thou canst not be healed. The Lord shall smite thee with madness, and blindness, and astonishment of heart. And thou shalt grope at noonday, as the blind gropeth in darkness, and thou shalt not prosper in thy ways, and thou shalt be only oppressed and spoiled evermore, and no man shall save thee. Thou shalt betroth a wife, and another man shall lie with her. Thou shalt build an house, and thou shalt not dwell therein. Thou shalt plant a vineyard, and shalt not gather the grapes thereof. Thine ox shall be slain before thine eyes, and thou shalt not eat thereof. Thine ass shall be violently taken away from before thy face, and shall not be restored to thee. Thy sheep shall be given unto thine enemies, and thou shalt have none to re rescue them. Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto, other peop unto another people, and thine eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all the day long, and there shall be no might in thine hand. The fruit of thy land and all thy labors shall a nation which thou knowest not eat up, and thou shalt be only oppressed and crushed alway so that thou shalt be mad for the sight of thine eyes, which thou shalt see. Who, what people in history has suffered as much as the Jews in the last 2,000 years? Again, divorce emotion from fact, all right? Just look back at the first century and say, okay, did the nation of Israel, did the Jewish people, as a large, you know, nationally I'm speaking here, not individually, but nationally, did they reject Jesus Christ? Yes. Did they still reject Jesus Christ? Yes. They do. What has happened to them? They've been persecuted. They've been hunted down. The Holocaust. Many different Holocausts, if you really want to get into it. Country after country, nation after nation. Just get these Jews out of here. Just destroy them. And we're going to go in and we're going to burn things down. And we're going to go torture them and do all kinds of horrible things to them. Why? Because they rejected the Word of God. And they rejected the Word, manifest Word of God. That's why. The Lord shall smite thee in the knees and in the legs with a sore. Sore botch that cannot be healed from the sole of thy foot unto the top of thy head. The Lord shall bring thee and thy king which thou shalt set over thee unto a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known. And there shalt thou serve other gods, wood and stone. And thou shalt become an astonishment, a proverb and a, and a byword among all nations, whither the Lord shall lead thee. <laughs> I mean, it's history. The Lord said, if you reject my word, if you reject me, this is what's going to happen to you. And it happened exactly like that. You should make thee a byword. You know, when I grew up, they'd say, um, uh, I'm just going to have to go and I'll, uh, I'll Jew that guy down. Did you ever hear that? Jip them down or, or Jew them down in price? What does that mean? It's somebody that's cheap, always looking to try to get money and whatever. Why? Because they're not in the land of promise. That's why. They're not where they're supposed to be. They rejected God's word. They rejected God manifest in the flesh. And so the Lord says, get out of here. He had to divorce Israel like a rotten wife. 
some woman comes along and she's married to you and whatever else. I talked earlier about a wife, you know, that other men are having her and things. And um, this wife, she comes along and she's no good and she's constantly cheating on her husband. And finally the husband just says, okay, I love you so much, but you know what? You don't obviously don't love me. Get out. Where am I supposed to go? Oh, what do I do? Get out of my home right now. I would have done great things for you here, but you don't, you don't have any right to this. Out. Get out of here. That's what God did to Israel. Oh, but you know, the blessing of God comes on the Jews as they're in America in the finance sector. Uh, no. Oh, the blessing of God comes upon the Jews that are in Russia, you know, and they can do the Bolshevik revolution and they can do the communist, you know, manifesto and you know, working with the Jesuits and, and they are a lot of them Jesuits and, and the Freemasonic, you know, the scheming and, and we can do this and we can, it's, it's not the blessing of God. Oh, well, brother, I, it's not fair. These, these uh, Jews and things out there, these big financier Jews and all these big, you know, we call them papal Jews or the Jews popes or, or the popes Jews, Jews popes. That actually might be true, too. <laughs> uh, but papal Juden, we like to call them, Juden being the German word for Jews. Papal Juden, oh, look at these big mansions that they're building. It's not fair. Let me tell you something. These big financier people, they live a very tortured life, serving mammon. The Bible says in the New Testament, 1 Timothy chapter 6, they that excuse me, they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Hmm, son of perdition is coming, and the Jews will accept him as their Messiah. Huh, interesting. Drown them in perdition. Here comes the son of perdition. Probably not really a tie-in, you know. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but um, these people, as I study the finance world and everything else, and I study these, these guys and and, uh, you know, Robert Kiyosaki, I saw this thing with him and he's, you know, uh, how many hundreds of millions of dollars are you in debt? Oh, no, I'm, I'm 1.2 billion in debt. Uh, you know, my marriage fell apart and everything's, you know, my health is failing. But, you know, uh, I've got lots of money because, you know, you see, I, I continually borrow money so I can make money and I can have this and that and whatever. Then why is your debt continually going up? Oh, you don't understand, Brian. That's success. <laughs> you know, uh, debt is wealth. Oh, really? Hmm. I'd rather be debt-free. I'd rather own a man anything. But these uh, wealthy people, Yudin, um, if you think for one second that they're enjoying their life, that they can sit there and they can enjoy that big mansion, their big mega mansion that's been financed with debt, they didn't get it from God. They got it from, well, the God of this world. They got it from him. But he puts you into debt. You want to owe Satan? What, remember what Jesus went through with, with the devil? He's up there being you know, tempted in things and fasting. And, and uh, the devil says, if you fall down and worship me, I'll give you the kingdoms. You mean that there are strings attached to what the devil gives you? Yeah. That's the system of debt. Hmm. You serve the Lord, he says, you can do what you want. I'd like you to do this for me, but it's completely voluntary. And if you work for me, I'll give you crowns at the judgment seat of Christ. A mansion in heaven. Walk around the streets of gold when you come up there. Perfect body, perfect health. Live with me forever. Lots of benefits to serving the Lord. Do you have to? No. It's free will. But with the devil, you want to serve him? Oh, it's going to cost you. That's why a lot of these celebrities, they sell their souls to Satan and they get a few years of anything that they want. And then the devil gets to kill them. Nobody actually tells them, you know, you can actually get out of that. But uh, uh, you, there's no such thing as a contract with Satan that you can't break. Okay, let me just put that out there. The devil's not that powerful. Don't give him more credit than he's worth. <laughs> credit, you know, <laughs> both ways. Um, <clears throat> okay, see, where did we stop here? Um, verse 38. Thou shalt carry much seed out into the field, and shalt gather but little in, for the locust shall consume it. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I just have to say this too about this financial stuff. Make sure that your money is always making you money. I, I don't want to save money because I want my money to be making me money. 
Uh, that's stupid because you're gambling, all right? And it, I'll be showing a quote here at some point in time about actual the finance world, Wall Street and everything else. And they literally said that it was designed because people in New York City, the Jews in New York City, like to gamble. That's what the stock market was created for. It's gambling. And, you know, well, I, I, put, I got big, you know, income from, you know, big dividends from investing in such and such, but I lost my shirt on this one over here. And they're just losing money all the time. And then they gain some money and then they do good and then they lose this and then this company goes out of business and they go, oh no, what do I do? And you know, back during the Great Depression, they were jumping off the buildings and splattering on the pavement. Why? Because they don't have true wealth. Hmm. Verse 39, thou shalt plant vineyards and dress them, but shalt neither drink of the wine nor gather the grapes for the worms shall eat them. Thou shalt have olive trees throughout all thy coasts, but thou shalt not anoint thyself with the oil, for thine olive shall cast his fruit. Thou shalt beget sons and daughters, but thou shalt not enjoy them, for they shall go into captivity. All thy trees and fruit of thy land shall the locust consume. The stranger that is within thee shall go up above uh, thee very high, and thou shalt come down very low. He shall lend to thee, and thou shalt not lend to him. He shall be the head, and thou shalt be the tail." You see the difference there? Hmm. And, you know, eventually when the Jews get wiped out, they're going to have to borrow money. You know, again, why is it not just the fifth kingdom is the miry clay or the clay or something or, you know, the Jewish people? It's not. It's iron mixed with miry clay. They have to go to Rome to get the money. They have to go to Rome to be protected. Hmm. They're not in charge, in other words. In spite of what some people think, oh, the, the Jews run everything. No, they don't. No, they don't. <laughs> okay. The Romans do. According to the scriptures. Uh, verse 45. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee and sh shall pursue thee and overtake thee till thou be destroyed, because thou hearkenest not unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which he commanded thee. And they shall, and they shall be upon thee for a sign and for a wonder, and upon thy seed forever, because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. Therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in want of all things, and he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck. Huh, iron mixed with miry clay again. Interesting. Until he have destroyed thee, the Lord shall bring a nation against thee from from far from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the old, nor show favor to the young. And he shall eat the fruit of thy cattle and the fruit of thy land, until thou be destroyed, which also shall not leave thee either corn, wine, or oil, or the increase of thy kind, or the flocks of thy sheep, until he have destroyed thee. Exactly what's going on, by the way, in Ukraine little po proxy nation of Israel uh, with the people using their uh, Zelensky as the president of it. It's kind of funny because, the, you know, the army of Rome, which is currently here in America, we're going to bring over um, some military grade weapons for you. Oh, really? We get the newest stuff? Oh, no, this is kind of old, outdated. You know, it's just kind of worn out, but it'll be all right. You going out there with these old outdated tanks and things. We're going to send a bunch of F-16s. We won't do the newer, what is it, F-22 Raptors or something. We'll just give you F-16s. But you'll be fine. Going against Russia, you'll be fine. Um, and they're over there saying, we've had 600,000 men killed and you know probably a, maybe a million wounded or, or however many it is right now. Um, can we have some better stuff, please? And the iron, uh, iron upon thy neck. You know, the ones that put iron upon their neck, thy neck, uh, they get you enslaved. And they say, no, that's good enough. Oh, keep fighting, by the way. Well, when can you come and help? Can't we have some help? Mm, uh, you still have some men left. Go back in there and fight. But the Russians, they're destroying us. Eh, you know, whatever. Go back, fight. <laughs> what a sick thing. Um... Verse 52, And he shall besiege thee and all thy gates, until thy high and fenced walls come down, wherein thou trustest. 
throughout all thy land, and he shall besiege thee in all thy gates throughout all thy land, which the Lord thy God hath given thee. And thou shalt eat the fruit of thine own body, the flesh of thy sons and of thy daughters, which the Lord thy God hath given thee, in the siege and in the straightness, wherein or wherewith thine enemies shall distress thee. That happened. Book of Lamentations. You can read it. They actually had to eat their own children. <clears throat> so that the man that is tender among you and very delicate, his eye shall be evil toward his brother and toward the wife of his bosom and toward the remnant of his children, which he shall leave, so that he will not give to any of them of the flesh of his children whom he shall eat, because he hath nothing left him in the siege and in the straightness, wherewith thine enemies shall distress thee in all thy gates. I have to just say this real quick. I remember reading the one story. I don't know if I have the book in here right now or not, but about the history of Rome, you know, uh, I forget what it's called, Rise and Fall of Rome, or I forget, something like that. It's been a while now since I read that thing. And um, there was a case where this um, Roman army came in and besieged this city. And the people in the city, they said, um, you're wasting your time. You see, we have, you know, 10 years worth of food and supplies in this city. So, um, you know, you're wasting your time out there. We're fine. We can outlast you. And the Roman general said, well, if you have 10 years of uh, food in your city, then we will be here for 10 years and one day. <laughs> Something to that effect. It wasn't, might not have been 10 years or whatever, but he, he said that to the guy in the city, the king in the city, and the king in the city said, we surrender. <laughs> in other words, the Romans are saying, no, oh, we'll outlive you. We'll last longer than you. We're going to encircle this a city of yours and we're going to camp against it and we'll set up our own city out here we'll have we'll be raising animals and we'll just we'll just sit here and just watch you die slowly and um the babylonians did that to israel they did that's why a lot of them went into captivity and um israel never came back as a great and mighty nation after the start of the fifth kingdom, or the five kingdoms, excuse me, because they rejected the Lord. And it's going to take Jesus Christ to get Israel truly back into a position of power. But um, even so, you need to head back to your land because that's the land of promise. That's where God can bless you. Uh, verse 56, The tender and delicate woman among you, which would not adventure to set the sole of her foot upon the ground for delicateness and tenderness, her eye shall be evil toward the husband of her bosom, and toward her son, and toward her daughter, and toward her young one that cometh out from between her feet, and toward her children, which she shall bear. For she shall eat them for want of all things secretly in the siege and in straightness, wherewith thine enemy shall distress thee in thy gates. It's kind of funny, too, because a lot of the women that are for abortion in this country, they're Jewish. Hmm. Now, granted, they aren't eating their children that are coming out. Um, but give them time and the right motivation, they probably would. Verse 58, If thou wilt not observe to do all the words of this law. You know, that's one of the biggest problems with America too. Let me just say this. One of the biggest problems with America is that we've lost the rule of law. It's just, you know, majority opinion now. If it feels good, do it. If thou wilt not observe to do all the words of this law that are written in this book, the word of God, that thou mayest fear this glorious and fearful name, the Lord thy God, then the Lord will make thy plagues wonderful, and the plagues of thy seed even great plagues, and of long continuance, and sore sickness, and of long continuance. Uh, when it says wonderful, it doesn't mean good, okay? It just means it's so amazing that there's no way that you can look at this and say, oh, it's just coincidence. You look at this and you say, wow, God has really turned on those people. Verse 60, Moreover, he will bring upon thee all the diseases of Egypt, which thou wast afraid of, and they shall cleave unto thee. Also every sickness and every plague, which is not written in the book of this, this law, them will the Lord bring upon thee until thou be destroyed. And ye shall be left few in number, whereas ye were as the stars of heaven for multitude, because thou wouldest not obey the voice of the Lord thy God. And it shall come to pass that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good, and to multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you, and to bring you to naught. 
and ye shall be plucked from off the land whither thou goest to possess it. Did it happen? Yes, it happened in the first century. They were kicked out, dispersed. Verse 64, And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people, from the one end of the earth, even unto the other. And there, there thou shalt serve other gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. And among these nations shalt thou find no ease, neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest. But the Lord shall give thee a, there a trembling heart, and failing of eyes, and sorrow of mind. That's what happens when you get into all this money stuff. Again, falling into temptation, a snare, many foolish and hurtful lusts. It's right there. It all ties together. Don't tell me, well, the New Testament I reject. The Old Testament's good. New Testament's bad. It all ties together if you're saved. The Holy Spirit of God will come and show you how it all ties together. Verse 66, And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night, and shalt have none assurance of thy life. In the morning thou shalt say, Would God it were even, and at even thou shalt say, Would God it were morning. For the fear of thine heart, wherewith thou shalt fear, and for the sight of thine eyes, which thou shalt see. And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships, by the way whereof I spake unto thee. Thou shalt see it no more again, and there ye shall be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen, and no man shall buy you. Pretty horrible curses. Did they come to pass? Yes, they did. Go to Ezekiel chapter 36. You know, the most challenging, I'm convinced, after studying this thing for many years, the most challenging thing um, for a Christian is to understand what God thinks of the nation of Israel and have to take stands against the Jewish people, but not completely. <laughs> In other words, you don't say that they're all just evil and there is no such thing as Jews and the Jews are no more and the church has replaced the Jews. That's too far. Uh, you just say, well, God blesses Israel and Israel, everything the Jewish people do is great. And I love their star of David. It's wonderful. You know, and it, that's going too far the other way. <laughs> um, well, yeah, there are Jews that are Freemasons, but they're, they're wonderful people. No, that's going too far. A Christian, the Bible-believing stand is, you understand that the scriptures teach the Jews have rejected Jesus Christ. He's not just a prophet that you can say, oh, I don't like the way he said it, you know, or whatever. God sent multiple prophets in the Old Testament. The major prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, you know, Ezekiel. And then you have the minor prophets, you know, Joel and Amos and Obadiah and, you know, all those guys. And the Lord sent multiple prophets. And they killed the prophets and and you know, tortured them, put them to death, whatever. And the Lord says, okay, I'm going to send my son. I'm going to, and then they'll reverence my son. And God comes down. The father says, let's form a body that can be put into a woman, into a virgin, and she will conceive and bear a son. And his name becomes Jesus. And he's down here. He can't say Joseph is my father. He has to say God is my father. And the Lord works it out that way. That's what the Bible teaches. Again, that's well, explain it exactly. Well, great is the mystery of godliness. I can't explain it exactly, but I know what the scriptures teach. The scriptures teach that the Father is the soul, and the Father creates the body. You never see the Father having his own body, a body of flesh. All right. Uh, well, the Bible says God is a spirit. Yes, God is a spirit, a spirit, a soul, and a body. It doesn't mean the Father is a spirit. People get that all mixed up. The whole point is, God is manifest in the flesh, and he's down here on the earth, and he tells the Jews, you know, he came to his own, and his own received him not. He's here. I'm here. I can be your king. I am God manifest in the flesh, and he does miracles to confirm. The Jews require a sign. Okay, the Lord says, okay, here's signs. I'll give you all these signs. He dies on the cross because they rejected him. They cause him to be put to death, work with the Romans. And I maintain that that's when the fifth kingdom started. We have no king but Caesar. They just started the fifth kingdom. The miry clay, the mingled Jews, joining with the iron. And it doesn't make a very good mixture. And that's why there's this love-hate relationship between the Jews and the Catholics. You see that. You see the friction that's caused between the Masonic 
uh, labor Zionists and the socialists and the Bolsheviks and all this other stuff. And then you have over here, you have the fascists and, and whatever. And, you, you know, Jesuits can tra contain both communism and socialism and fascism. So there's both of that there. It's just, it's this mess. It's a complete, total mess. Why? Because they rejected the word of the Lord. That's why. And as a Christian, you have to look at this thing and you have to, this is so complicated, but you have to say, I'm not going to completely stand against the Jews. I will never completely stand against the Jews. Anybody Jewish, they're all evil, they're all bad. Uh, no, I'm not doing that. Well, then you'll cover up for their sins. No, I'm not going to do that either. But what can I do? What can I, as a Christian preacher, offer you out there if you're Jewish? The most basic thing we can argue about was Jesus really the Messiah? Was the New Testament accurately translated as the Hebrew and the King James Bible? Blah, 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 whatever. But I can say one thing that I know for sure. One thing that is a pure, 100% sure word of prophecy that I can say to any Jew. You're better off in the land of Israel. 100%. I never have to worry about that failing. Any Jew out there, I can advise you, go to the land of Israel. God will provide for you there. It's your land of promise. I support the Jews' right to be in their land, wholly and completely. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 16 through 24. That's where we'll end this study. Ezekiel 36, verse 16. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own way and by their doings. Their way was before me as the uncleanness of a, of a removed woman. Wherefore I poured my fury upon them for the blood that they had shed upon the land and for their idols wherewith they had polluted it. And I scattered them among the heathen, and they were dispersed through the countries. According to their way and according to their doings, I judged them. And when they entered into the under the heathen, whether they went, they profaned my holy name when they said to them, These are the people of the Lord, and are gone forth out of his land. But I had pity for mine holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen, whither they went. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for mine holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen, whither ye went. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. Interesting. For I will take you from among the heathen and will gather you and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land, the land of promise. God is going to do that. Now, Christian, young Christian out there, I'm going to tell you something. There are a number of key scriptures that you need to write down. You need to put it, underline it or something, or I take collared pencils, you know, and I, I highlight things like this with a collared pencil, much better than markers um, or little special, you know, pens or whatever else. I have some of them around here people send me, but um, I like to use collared pencils, okay? But mark these verses. Ezekiel chapter 36 verses 16 through 24. Very important because you'll see people and they'll say, it was the people over there, they're not real Jews because it was the Illuminati through the Rothschilds that brought them back into their land. So how could they be real Jews? See, you know, they didn't come back believing in Jesus, you know, or Yeshua as their Messiah. They didn't come back for that. You know, it was the Rothschilds and the Balfour Declaration and all this other stuff. Um, God brought them back. The Bible says that they would come back to their land. Israel has been reborn as a nation. That's a more sure word of prophecy. Jesus prophesied that in Matthew chapter 24. It's happened. Oh no, it's all happened in the first century. Go take a long walk off of a short pier, okay, and don't come back. Swim across the sea and whatever else, you crazy nut preterist out there. Um, no, everything didn't happen in the first century. Okay, um, we're seeing prophecy being fulfilled. All right, if it happened in the first, and think about this, just think about this with the preterist thing. Everything Matthew chapter 24 happened in the first century. Okay, rocks for brains. Um, and there's no nice way for me to put this. I, you know, it, it's just you're an idiot if you believe in preterism. All right, 
Uh, the nation of Israel is there in Matthew chapter 24. Jesus Christ is speaking to the disciples. The disciples are showing him the buildings of the temple. It's there. It's present. Okay. Um, it goes away. And then he, it comes back. Jesus prophesied the destruction of the temple and that Israel would be reborn as a nation. Did that all happen in the first century before the New Testament's finished? No, it didn't. And if it did, okay, um, then so it came, it went away, the temple is destroyed, goes away, comes back, and then it goes away again during the millennial kingdom or the thousand years or two thousand years or what? all mixed up. The Bible teaches that when the Jews rejected Jesus Christ, the Lord kicks them out of their land. Like an adulterous woman, the Lord puts away Israel as an unfaithful wife. Get out. Get out of here. But then he brings them back. He says, I'm doing this for my name. Hmm. There's some woman out there walking around, and she has my last name. She's mine. I'm going to bring her back into my house again. And that house is land. The land of promise. And if you're a Jew, you need to get back to that land. Um, don't think I'm anti-Semitic for saying get away from America. All Jews need to leave America. Oh, he's such, such a Jew hater. I'm not a Jew hater. Not at all. I'm the best friend that you have. Because I'm telling you, Get out of America. You don't belong here. Not a racist thing. No hatred in my body at all for the Jewish people. But I know what the scriptures say. And the scriptures say that uh, if you're a Jew, the land of promise is in Israel, not in America. The land of promise is in Israel, not in England. The land of promise is in Israel, not China, Russia, India any other place where you could make lots of money. You go back to your land and you don't leave it. Let the Lord provide for you. Don't be like Ruth and go and have your children marry off to the heathen people of the land. Interesting because back there in uh, Deuteronomy, it was talking about how that the parents would look at their children and they would, their hearts would ache for their children and things. Um, what was it like for Ruth? I'm sorry, Naomi. Naomi. What was it like for Naomi when she saw her husband die? And then she watches her two sons die. And the thought comes into her mind, God could have protected us in our land. What is it going to be like for the Jews that uh, don't leave America? Probably very much like it was for the Jews that didn't leave Germany when they should have. And they look and they see, here come the Nazi soldiers on the door. Come to the door. Yes. Come with us. Put the guns on them. They get on the bus or whatever else. They go down there. You know, the famous pictures of them like this and the German soldiers are behind them. You go this way. And the children say, Mommy? Mommy? Come on. They grab the children and they take them off and the wife is crying and as she sees her children going this way and there goes her husband that way and she's going into this place here. Terrible. Absolutely terrible. And it all could have been avoided if they had just stayed in the land of promise. You say, well, Brother Brian, there was no Germany back then. Um, or excuse me, there was no Israel as a, as a nation that they could go to. It was still there. It was still there. Well, the Bible says that they were scattered. Yeah, but you know what? They could still come back. And um, I don't even care if there would be a land of Israel or not. If I was a Jew, I'd be there in the land of Israel. What's well, called Palestinia or it's called uh, whatever, you know, Mohammedville or something. I don't care. That's the land that God gave to my ancestors. I'm going back there because I have no right to go any other place. That's what I would think. So that is going to be it for this study. If you're a Jew, I hope that you understand the spirit of what I'm preaching. I'm not against the Jewish people, not at all. But if you're going to go away from God and you're going to go into a place that's not yours, into a land that doesn't belong to you, 
you don't have God's uh, promise of protection. So that is going to be it. And um, please do pray about these things. And uh, so we'll see you in the next study. Thank you very much for watching. King James Video Ministries has been faithfully preaching and teaching from God's Word since 2008. Our YouTube channel has never been monetized, and we do not accept money from the lost world because this would violate the Scriptures. King James Video Ministries is supported by saved brethren in accordance with 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17-18. through 18. If you have been blessed by our videos, we would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting this ministry financially. You can donate online by visiting www.kingjamesvideoministries.com or by sending a check or money order to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 214, Patton, Maine, 04765. Thank you to all who donate to this ministry, and we pray for the Lord's blessing in your lives.